All right, welcome everybody to a very special episode. Today we have Mr. Joey Warnker in the house. Hello. Thank you for joining us, or I should say, thank you for letting us join you. Ah, in this. you're welcome. Thank you for letting me be part of your thing. The Hustle Sanctuary. The Hustle shank- Sanctuary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude, this is cool. So, is this the fir- first podcast you've done in your studio, by the way? This is the second podcast I've done in my studio. Oh, shit, man. I wanted to be first. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Wait, this is the first podcast I've done in my studio. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> With editing, we'll, like, make all that work. Yeah, this is the, this is, this is it. Um... Okay, so so talk to us, you know, with without further ado, let's just jump right in. Okay. Talk to us about, you know, where you grew up uh-huh. and um, you know, what was what was little Joey like and and when did you dis- <laughs> when did you discover that you had this gift and this love for um, you know, music and drumming? Um, well, I grew up uh I grew up in Los Angeles like uh, mostly on the west side like uh I guess I guess what's what's now like the Pacific Palisades. So it's always been kind of a you know extremely nice place or whatever, like wealthy enclave. But I think when I was growing up, it was maybe a little more like humble than it is now. Now it seems like it's super exclusive. I'm always f- freaked out when I go there, and like when I go back to where I grew up, and like none of the houses that were there or very few of the houses that were there including the one I grew up in are still that like they've been knocked down and giant houses have been built Hmm. in their place but anyway um so yeah this kind of bucolic like near the beach and really you know like you know riding skateboards and bikes and um roaming around a neighborhood by myself with my little friends kind of pretty amazing like perfect childhood in in many ways <laughs> that's awesome surfing <laughs> surfing eventually some people even went like pro i loved it and i was it was fun but i i was never i was like the least advanced i was always sort of more 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 um a little more cautious i guess i mean i was always in, interested in drums and then by the time i was probably I want to say seven, maybe. I was making drum sets out of, like, pillows or pots and pans kind of thing and playing along to uh, Kiss Records until my mom finally um, bought me a drum set when I was probably, like, eight or nine, something like that. And uh, and my uncle was, is a drummer, and he gave me some initial lessons. That week I learned Led Zeppelin IV, top to bottom, and that was the beginning of my sort of, you know, whatever, lifelong journey. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I'm imagining once that, like, you got bit by the by the drum bug and you got that kit, like, were you skipping going out as a kid and being with friends? Were you just, like, more interested in just, like, playing drums at that point? Or um, No, I think I was, I, I didn't skip it, but... Uh, I I definitely spent a lot of my time like you know doing that and I think uh um I eventually w- like gave up uh skateboarding and and surfing because that was clearly it was like either I'm going to do that or play music and playing music was you know but that's like that was more like 12 13 was your family supportive i thought i read somewhere like when you wanted to pursue drumming like your Uh family wasn't exactly like stoked on that or something oh no my my family was always like very supportive i mean the the this there was a subtle thing that happened where my dad was you know he's in the music business in a big way and like you know, I think he was always supportive, but at some points he had said, you know, like, you, you know, probably jokingly, like, you know, musicians or drummers or, or something, you know, or that's that's a tough road or like those those dudes are can be trouble or something like, yeah. you know, st- stuff like that. But I mean, when it came to it, like he brought me to the studio and, you know, some of my formative 
experiences that I still like some of my clearest memories and I consider myself to have like, kind of like a foggy memory in general but like I remember being a a little kid like you know 11 11 to 13 and being going getting to go to the studio with my dad and like the drummers he was using became my heroes and they mm. were these sort of like elite studio drummers of the time like Jeff Beccaro and Steve Gadd and I would they were very, you know, sweet and generous and would like let me sit in the drum booth and I would just and I remember everything about those experiences like like as if it were yesterday. It's and, amazing. And still carry a lot of it out like you know, I I think I learned how to tune drums more from like watching Steve Gadd and more and more so Jeff Beccaro than like anything else. I remember <clears throat> the kind of tissue yeah that and tape that were used to dampen the drums and you know how he i watched how he tuned it like the pattern that he you know m moved from the areas of the drum to tune hmm. and how he was doing it the whole thing i remember it and and uh and spent years obsessively kind of researching what i had watched um to make sure that you know, I, I had a better understanding of what he was doing, but, you know, like I said, to this day, I, rem I remember it as if it were, you know, yesterday's. I can't remember anything that even happened yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you eat for breakfast, John? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> um, did you have a mentor per se, you know, uh -huh. did when you were coming up, like if I had to say like, one guy was one guy a mentor to you yeah i had my uncle okay. who was you know my sort of teacher and spent so much time with me and was really you know um instrumental for me like you know so he was like a big figure and he would be like the mentor in my life and then you know then i had these you know, brief but extremely impactful encounters with uh, the studio drummer, the uh, like the studio drummers like Jeff Beccaro and Steve Gadd, which were, um, you know, like you know, extremely important, and I looked up to them. And those those brief encounters were, um, you know, pretty pretty impactful, I would say. So talk to us about, you know, the, the value of mentorship is that, do you feel like that's extremely important? I can sp speak from my, my, my bubble, <laughs> my personal experience was that, I mean, ultimately like whatever was going on in my, f whatever like bad stuff or dysfunction in my childhood and family, like I was always encouraged to be creative and I had my uncle and my dad took me to the studio and I had these experiences with these drummers and and um so there was definitely mentorship and encouragement that kind of gave me the uh the uh you, you know I don't know if it just inspired me or if there was more you know maybe I was also encouraged. Well, no, I know that I was encouraged because like Steve, they would let me, Jeff Beccaro would like tell me to play his drums and I would play them. And even though I was left-handed, I would figure out how to play his drums backwards and everyone, you know, I'd suddenly be jamming with like Michael McDonald or whatever. <laughs> and everyone was like, that's insane. That's, that's a good confidence booster, right? Totally. Yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. insane. That, um, that that kid can actually play so that must have I know that I would hear that resonating in my psyche somewhere like through my life like hmm. when things got tough when there was like you know a dumb band teacher when I was a teenager it was like you know you, you're you not good enough or whatever like I'd be like um, I was jamming with like the cats the A-listers and when I was like a little kid and they were stoked and and yeah. then I play like I got to play on a song where there was like military snare drum. Jeff was like, "We gotta let Joey play the snare drum," because you know we're all playing together. But I could follow them 
when I was a f- little tiny kid. So. What was the first record that you ever, ever drummed on? Like, I think it's the Randy Newman. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I Love L.A., but I'd have to fact check it. Wow. You could fact check it. We're gonna fact check. We'll we'll cue it up with the notes after the show. I think that's it's, pretty amazing. I think I'm credited. Let's pick up the storyline. So, and then ultimately you find your way into Beck's band, right? At some point, I know you said you were in your teens when you joined Beck, right? No, like I was like in my late twenty or my uh, like early twenties. Early twenties, late twenties, okay. early twenties. But um, um, no, but I mean, like I was. I guess the first. The first, I realized that, that I was drumming professionally from, I guess, age 14. Mm. Like, you know, I was, ma- you know, playing gigs and making like, you know, a couple hundred bucks a week, which for a 14-year-old kid living with, you know, like well-off family, that was, I was like, you know, I was loaded. <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> and you know that was I mean I tried to have like jobs when I was a kid but I was like I don't jobs like working at like an ice cream shop or exactly something like that. Yeah. I had I worked at an ice cream shop <laughs> <laughs> but it was like I don't need this job or like it's getting in the way of me like playing these gigs yeah and I just did that through high school and it didn't I never really took it seriously but you know I, I mean well, it's That's cool because you did come up in a family where, you know, your dad was successful in the music business, right? So it's like you you already, like, kind of came up around what was possible, I guess, right? Um, I think, like, for somebody growing up in, like, Wisconsin or something, you know, who didn't maybe come up with just being around the music business and seeing yeah. that it was possible, does that make sense? I think there was almost like a, um, like a ta- tacitly thought that these things and then he was he my father was you know encouraging my my dad likes to tell the story of how I came to him when I was 14 and said dad I want to join this band and we have to go see them play I have to go see them play a gig to you know to check it out and my dad you know his instinct was to say like you're not joining a band and playing gigs that's ridiculous but he took me to see the band at this, you know, club in like East Hollywood. It was, you know, couldn't believe he was doing it. And like, he should have just said no. And then we get there and um, it's this Western swing band, which is like music from, it's like his childhood, like not like a punk band or anything like that. It was, he was, and they were all in like perfect costumes and playing the original instruments and he was like thrilled he's like oh sure you can join this band that's great i'll come to every show and this is amazing <laughs> that's awesome he was like the nightmare would have been like like a guns and roses show like you know right like a hair metal band <laughs> right, yeah. or a punk band yeah or... drugs all littered all over the stage like exactly. he like he, yeah yeah but that's kind of what <laughs> right exactly i guess the only downside that people have pointed out to me and that is true is that uh there's a little bit of a stigma, you know, of course, like your dad's like in the successful in the music business and you want to be a musician and that's, that's great. But then suddenly you have the whole, the whole thing of like being, you know, competing with your dad in a weird way or feeling like sitting in a very large shadow. You're standing in a right. very large shadow. So there exactly. we go. We, we did it. We got to some adversity, Joe. Oh, yeah, adversity. I know. <laughs> there we go. I don't ha- it's like I don't have great <laughs> adversity. What were you feeling, I guess, well, when that thought hit you, like I'm standing in a large shadow? And, uh. Yeah, I, I, um, as I got older and I was, you know, doing the gigs, but then suddenly feeling that, like, pressure of, like, wait a minute, like, if I'm playing gigs like this, like and my dad's over here and I'm in this I'm in this massive shadow like what does it mean or what am I supposed to do or you know like people you know and then people say things like you know you're whatever you have a silver spoon in your mouth or you know there's nepotism like what they discredit your talent because of that yeah, sometimes there's, right there, and there's a there's know. a lot of that and th- there was also like people people somehow it it filtered in that there was like a weird 
sort of subtle pressure like well you know your dad's in the music business like you should be in the music business you should be like behind a desk behind yeah. a desk like making yeah. money not like hmm. being like the little guy out there like playing playing drums you weren't even the front man no they yeah, I'm not even the front man, <laughs> but and the idea of being a front man is even more terrifying because that's right. like whoa the fear of failure in that shadow is is suddenly accentuated or certainly in my childhood where like there i feel like there was just a lot of expectation that's like the dark side of la too like crappy values of like you're only as good as how successful you are how, your last hit your last hit and how you know whatever how good you look or how many if you're a dude how many like hot girls you have or all that stuff the front man or whatever yeah it's like as a drummer it really doesn't matter how old you are like you said you were drumming when you were 14 right in somebody's band like yeah. you, know, you could be like 60 and be drum. i mean it just it doesn't phase you as much if you're the front man right yeah and then also like if if you're like the front man you know, people can kind of grow tired of you or whatever. If you're, it happens, right? People sure. just kind of get burnt out on a band. and Sure. It's cool that you could sort of... You're like, you know, Canada or Switzerland or something. I guess I went on a little journey to figure out that I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. You know, and I think just by f my father being, you know, as successful as he And for the was, listeners, I thought yeah. he, he ran Warner for... A time, yeah, right? He, yeah, he ran Warner Brothers. So I was like, you know, what leader, what leadership thing am I going to do? Like, I have to figure out how to, you know, live up to that. I think in it that in those days, I, there was a lot of talk about, you know, like, oh my goodness, this this could be the first generation in a long time where kids are not as successful as their parents. This is really bad, as if that's something that's really bad. That was like you know, sort of a mid late eighties topic, like, you know, the baby boomers were so much more successful than their parents. And now, you know, now the next generation is like generation X. And I definitely grew up in the, there was like a lot of media when I was, you know, like in my late teens, that was like, this is the apathetic generation that, you know, basically is the, these are like kids, kids these days. <laughs> These are the worst kids ever, basically. <laughs> yeah, right? I just remember, like, the plaid, the despondency, right? Like, plaid t-shirts, cigarettes, like, sitting in a corner. Basically, like, Kurt Cobain was, like... Yes. That embodiment. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. You and, know? And I just felt like the media certainly, like, you know, didn't... You know, of course, I'm sure there's, they're not making it up, but they certainly, they certainly, like made more out of it and then you know and there were there were there was uh there was slackers there was the movie slackers that came out that was you know like <laughs> but, but and it was funny and as a kid i always resented that because i'm like hey wait a minute like me and my friends we want to work hard and we want to speak out against things we don't believe in and there was plenty of stuff in the 80s to not believe in. yeah that's for sure yeah and um like today maybe not at nearly as bad but pretty bad we were like wait why is this why are there like big news articles about how like lame our generation is this this is this is this is terrible like so i went i went on this journey to kind of find who what i really wanted to do because i because of living in my father's shadow back to that um it's like wait what what kind of a leader am i going to be if my dad's a leader like i have to be don't i have to be a leader and and At what so, age did you start to question this or start to realize this? 18, I would say. And then, and so I was like, I'll go to college because I'm, I can, <laughs> and I'm into that. And where'd and you go to school? I went to, and I went to school in the Midwest. In did Minneapolis. you? I went, yeah. Where? Um, it's called, um, McAllister. Okay. So what was your degree? In? It ended up being music. <laughs> okay. Of course. <laughs> but I did, I, I initially went there thinking that I would, you know, just be like a liberal arts student, like study like, uh, you know, English or something, philosophy or history or, something, or yeah. philosophy or something like that, and just figure out what, what I, do I really want to be a musician or is there something else that I actually want to do or, or, you know, what do I want to do? And maybe, you know, maybe I want to just escape my family. Like, is that an answer? And, you know, all of these, all of these things um, were going on in my sort of young young mind and I was you know 
like again acknowledging like I have the sort of coming from a privileged position where like I can go to a fancy expensive private college and figure this out and I was like well I better take advantage of that opportunity and then I got to school and I basically I was in Minneapolis which in the 80s was like a fantastic music scene and these independent record labels were there and they were amazing and and um, Chicago was not far away with uh, other incredible stuff and all these clubs and little venues and band million bands and so I just immediately got swept into that (laughs) then the next thing I knew it was like changed my major to music because I was in a band and we were on tour. Were you guys trying to get signed? We got signed. We got the whole thing. We got like the, you know, this was before the internet. We would, uh, you know, go to Kinko's and make, like, make the cover of the cassette. And we were playing gigs all the time and the cassettes were selling out at the shows and at all the the local record stores, of which there were many, because that's, it was a music town. And before we knew it, we had sold... 10,000 cassettes and they were all over the place and then like every label was coming in to see us and we were a buzz band in in uh, Rolling Stone and where are you at in your college degree third year fourth year this that's point? like by th- probably like third year okay so yeah I was like you know my ego in college was was pretty like I mean drummers are known to be like driving Rolls Royces into pools and stuff like that but for me it was like you know I'm happy in the back yeah kind of thing like I was growing into that but it was like I could also walk around and be like oh yeah you're in Rolling Stone and so that you know that was just enough so were you, were you thinking <laughs> like like this is my third year and now I don't need to finish my degree and let me just like go with this wave that I'm experiencing with this band no I mean I've I've I think I put a lot of pressure on myself you know my my world was so uh nurturing to be honest mm. My family was always, always supportive. Like when I was in the band with my dad, like I was like so nervous at one point that he was, he was gonna say like, "Can you, can you focus on school and then, and then come back to the band? Like, can you just wait two years or something?" And instead, he was like, "You got to figure it out. You got to do what you you need to do. And you know, your if the band is your passion, and if it's going well, and if that's really what you want to do, you need to figure it out. You know." And I was like, wow, that's that that to this day is is such wonderful advice. Listen up to the parents out there, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so let's pick up the storyline. So after you get your degree, right? You know, you come back to LA. Eventually. And, uh, yeah. Eventually. And then you, you find yourself joining Beck's band not too long after that, right? Yeah, well, I was in my band from college and uh we were signed and we made two records on an indie label and then after two years of slogging it out and it wasn't we didn't quite get to the point where that was really working like a lot of those bands did at the time and and the major labels were still kicking around and they and even though we didn't trust them which we were right um they all said you know you we're not going to change we're not going to try and change you or put any pressure on you we just want to give you a a wider a, a, a wider audience basically like we just want to give you the the chance because if you're on an indie label they just can't afford to like get you out there as much so after two years we kind of were like well let's check it out but that sort of you know happened at the same time as like <clears throat> internal problems like you know probably just normal band stuff when you've been together for like five years things start to get a little Rocky, and now we're trying to sign to our major label, and we all wanted to try shifting out of mini. We wanted to shake it up and like let's move out of Minneapolis, and we couldn't decide. We were like it's either L.A. or New York, and we couldn't decide which. And then finally, I just moved back to L.A. because my friend, my best friend, had a, this like you know great house, and I wanted. He was like, I got a room. You got to come here. I was like, cool. See you guys. I'm going to L.A. now. Mm. And I'll see you. Th- I'll see you there when you figure it out. And then they moved to New York, so the distance became impossible. And then one of the first people I met when I was in LA was Beck. Mm. And so suddenly I'm like hanging out with him, and we're good buddies, and we're also playing. I'm playing drums with him, and 
started going on little tours with him. And was he I, just getting started at the time, right? Well, or, he or had this before Loser. This is right around the time of Loser. So mm-hmm. like Loser was kind of gaining, and then mm. and and then uh, and then um, he could you know play shows. And then his record came out. Did, did you guys have just just that there was this sort of instant sort of chemistry? I, I think, guess I think so. There yeah. was an instant rapport. Yeah, instant chemistry, really cool. and and um, um, and then in the meantime, in the background with my band, we were ha- you know there's all this distance and like, and then I was kind of like waiting. There was a main writer in the band, and he was kind of. You know, predictably, what would happen in those scenarios is it's, it's, it's often like you you have a little writing slump. So he was having a writing slump, and things were taking a long time. And so I'm like, kind of waiting for my band to regroup. And did that make your decision easier? It well, suddenly I'm just immersed in Beck. We're just always doing stuff, and I was really enjoying it. Suddenly it was like, you know, do I jump ship and like become, you know. My like my new friend who I'm absolutely enamored with, like, um, and enamored with his music and everything. Like, if I go here, it's I'm leaving my I'm leaving my th- my like own thing mm-hmm. that I'm a full member of, and now I'm now I'm like gonna be working for the, I'm like em- uh, a part time employee of this guy. You know, when you break it down in those terms. It's really, and it's funny how things went. I was like, well, I'll just end up getting in a band. Mm. Like, if the if Beck doesn't f- turn into a band, I'll end up getting into a band. That's just how it's going to go. And that's just how I'm going to do it. And it didn't work like that. Well, interestingly enough, I just, <laughs> I just became very, very, very successful as a side musician. So I was, like, courted by giant bands but never to be a band member Hmm. you know would never it was never like come it was not like the metallica and i'm not and i'm not trying to say i feel sorry it sounds like i feel sorry for myself i hear that a little bit i'm like no it's just interest interesting it's like i i was like i'm gonna find my own thing eventually but like what really ended up happening is like i ended up um getting hired a lot (laughs) Which became my own thing. Eventually. It is your own thing. Well, now it is, and I'm cool <laughs> like, with it. But at the time, I was like, "Oh no, I'm not doing my own thing." This but is it, weird. It, it almost sounds like you were just like you were going down like the the lazy river or something like that. Basically, I if think that makes a little, sense, you know, a little bit. I mean, I I think I got so much out of playing with Beck. I think I it was able to develop my musicianship so much. Playing with him, it felt like we were in a band. But you know the re- the reality was that sure he liked collaborating, but it was never going to be. Hmm. It was never going. He was never going to be like cool. You're or you need to be my permanent drummer or whatever. You know. I mean, uh, there was a lot of talk at the time. Like this is like Crazy Horse. Like aren't we? Aren't aren't you Neil Young and aren't we Crazy Horse or aren't I? You know. He'd already like bent over backwards to get himself to where he was right. by himself. Why would he suddenly be like, you know? cool i just met you and and i love playing with you and like n- now like w- with all this stuff that i've taken five years to build up like let's let's like share it <laughs> right <laughs> it's like ridiculous you right know? Uh, but for me creatively it was so inspiring and exciting because i was on exactly the same page as him which i think was zeitgeist of the time as well it was very timely like he he was fusing a lot of different genres that all made sense together in an odd way. Um, and, you know, people will call that pastiche, which is, he was doing that too. But the thing that was drawing me was that I was, like, interested in new underground music and old underground music as well, but then also blues and folk and, like, world music, for lack of a better description. And, like, here's this guy who's, like, same exact reference points Hmm. and um he's figured out a way to make them all work together and and uh it was very exciting well let's talk about where that goes from there so i know you mentioned you were helping rem well yeah and then after after a certain amount of time in 
in Beck, like I was saying before, what ended up happening was suddenly like other bands were suddenly like courting me. Yeah, I was just getting phone calls. Like the first one was the Smashing Pumpkins. They had a falling out with their drummer, who was an integral part of the band. Mm. Um, So they were going through drummers. And then suddenly I was like being courted and ended up doing a, I guess, playing on, I mean, there's a couple drummers on the record Adore by the Smashing Pumpkins, but, you know, I ended up on a lot of Adore. And and then, you know, Billy asked me to come on tour. And, and what it ended up coming down to was I just started rehearsing with them and the that band at that time was <clears throat> starting to melt down and the environment was too toxic for me. Mm. <laughs> I couldn't handle it. Hmm. <laughs> there was a lot of strife in that camp. So it was like, it was, it was really scary actually. So I, I just, and then, you know, and it was like, well, we're hiring you to be like a side musician. And even though it was like a massive step up, wh- whatever, in terms of, you know, there are bigger bands, it's a, big band but i just i was like this is their last this is the band's about to break up and my instinct on that was absolutely correct that was their last tour and then i i ended up joining rem but again as a as a side musician which was always an interesting position because i don't know creatively or something for me there was always like the a little bit of a yearning like because i had my original band and it it didn't it's like it didn't work or I, it didn't work for me, and I was like, always sort of torn a little bit. Like, mm. you know, why didn't I, why didn't I either stick it out or figure out how to um, start another thing, or you know, and and I think, I think I did try. I I know I was always trying a little bit. I was never able to, to do it. And looking back, it was like the choices would have basically been do something like quit back not play with R.E.M. and try to do my own thing versus, you know, and I definitely did not have the fire to, uh, like, look, like, turn away from those things. There And there was maybe a conversation that went along the lines of, like, well, after five years in R.E.M., you'll, you know, we'll make you some kind of a band member. Mm-hmm. So that was, a, that was always something that was important to me, I guess. And then after five years... The, there was a long time off, and in that period, I was spending all my time in the studio and really loving it. And then uh, they called and, and said, okay, we're going to do like an 18-month straight recording and touring, you know, starting in about six months. And are you, you know, just want to tell you that's what we're doing. And I said, well, it's been five years, and there were, you know, conversations about me being a band member and if I'm not going to be a band member or or get a some sort of a elevated elevated status then um it's not I'm I'm having too much fun doing my own thing in LA and and I I think I'm just going to focus on that because that's where my passion is right now um and and so then they they called back and they said okay let's We'll talk about it and see what happens. So they called back and said, "No, we just want to <laughs> hire you again." And and I said, "Okay, I'm really walking away." And I and that was it. It was a great lesson in experience for me and going forward because it was like I was I was definitely firmly putting my foot into the world of being like you know a, a for hire musician and producing stuff and you know being able to do that is very, I I learned was very important. And, you know, as hard of a decision as that was, I proved to myself that I could do that. Hmm. And it was the right decision on every level at the time. That decision, you know, beyond like whatever sense of, um, you know, feeling like, like, oh my God, I'm leaving, I'm leaving REM. That's like, I'm leaving this giant band. That's crazy. Or like, I've been with them forever. What are they going to do? I'm like totally putting them in a terrible position. Anytime that I think you're in a situation like that, there's like some version of all of those things, whatever guilt and 
responsibility and all these things like versus what you really want to do is like sometimes it doesn't let you figure out what you really want to do your guilt and your pride and your loyalty get in the way it clouds the decision making process yeah and you're you're not able to say like wait a minute like i need to do these things for myself and that's going to be better for everyone if i know what i really want to do like it's like when you're breaking up with a girl it's not you it's me (laughs) (laughs) i guess be honest but also be you know compassionate and and uh otherwise you're just never going to talk to that person again right (laughs) Right. it's always going to be in the it's always going to be like a ghost in your life that's like oh i fucked that up absolutely And, and i think i fucked up leaving my first band and it haunted me hmm and I think when I left Beck to join REM, I had trouble confronting Beck properly. And then I think with REM, it was like the first time that I was able to you know, be a little bit more focused in my decision. As stressful as it was, once I knew exactly what my true parameters were, it's like, okay, this is the yes or no situation. I'm working all the time at home, loving it, totally inspired getting getting everything out of it and financially it's actually better than rem or i'm now a member of rem and i have a little bit more responsibility that would be the only way i could go into rem and so it was really easy it was easy if they say yes then that's that's cool if they say no that's totally fine i'm happy to stay home and keep doing what i'm doing so i was you know producing little little records and I did there was a while where I was doing music for film and TV and I was developing that and I loved the studio thing and I was kind of going back to my early childhood experiences of seeing these studio drummers and being in the studio and I was like you know for better or for better or worse you know this is this is what's clicking and I'm just going to follow it so like you know I would turn down um, like scoring an indie film because I would be hired to play on a whatever giant record for three weeks. Mm -hmm. And the giant record, I was, you know, that was just more exciting to me. And it would be, you know, like the indie movie would be like, I'd have to pay a lot of dues. And I was, and I already was in the place in my life where I was like, wait a minute, I don't know if I want to pay these dues (laughs) right now. Versus like, you know, go and record with whoever shall remain nameless. Um, and it's, you know, make a ton of money. It's really fun. You know, all of my drumming creativity is being called upon. Yeah. I'm I'm in a, you know, situation where everyone's looking to me to bring bring what I have. And it didn't feel overwhelming at all. My strength is drumming. So I've I just decided to follow that. Yeah. I've had people on the show that, like, there was a poet that came on and she was so good at poetry like you know um like national finals and everything and then she was like trying to learn an instrument you know and it's like when you go right. from being so amazing at something and getting such <laughs> like you know what i mean yeah adulation and then you're just like okay i'm gonna start over i'm gonna like just go from like you know back to the beginning oh i know it's a tough process it's a tough process yeah yeah, yeah it's a, and i love it but it was also like I didn't love it enough to like completely abandon like what I was actually really good at. Yeah. So, okay. So that's, yeah, that's the path I took. Then late, late in life, suddenly like I'm collaborating with my friend and we're trying to do, a, we're, we're trying to do a band, which, which we did. It took us a long time, but um, we did this little band project called Ultra Ista. We also ended up in Adams for Peace. We were hanging out with Tom and and then I think Tom had the idea of Adams for Peace. He wanted to do projects all the time and there's just only so much Radiohead can do. It's just right. doesn't work that way. And right. You have to let it breathe sometimes, right? You kinda gotta just, let it yeah. Kinda gotta let it breathe and the way that band is I think that they I think Radiohead's more like spend a long time making a record, play like 30 shows or something and then take a year off in that year off period for tom i think he was like i'm not i can't be sitting around it right this this time i need to be active and creative i can't just like Mm. not do anything which is you know understandable theoretically 
we'll probably you know maybe the next time there's a, a little a little breather we'll do it again but uh you know it's a slow it's a slow process and yeah we're all have families and are you know not not in our 20s so. <laughs> i feel like you've said that before <laughs> um, when you think of a newer band that's just getting started there's obvious uh-huh. adversity obviously there's adversity all over the place sure you gotta slug it out sure but for these bigger more established bands uh-huh what would the adversity be for these bigger more established bands if you had to like name it or is it just pretty I, much smooth sailing for i don't know how to name it um <laughs> different i guess mm-hmm. and it, it's such a different level to be um because it's not ad- adversity is definitely the wrong word at that point you know my water's not you know 72 degrees i don't know you know i don't know <laughs> they, they they put these riders online i'm oh, sure you've sure. seen them with like you know i want all green skittles or wh- whatever yeah well i think that's ridiculous you know <laughs> but i th- i think pressure to live up to whatever you've you've done in the past you know there's suddenly you're like if you're a public figure there's just a lot of there's an intense amount of pressure and it takes a certain uh constitution to be able to manage that and and navigate it it's not really adversity because you're like rich and famous but the pressure of trying to do that can be like you know can make people crazy and can lead to terrible you know terrible depression so there's that there's that side of it you know and the you know the exhaustion of the pre- the pressure that come and the, uh, the all of the different levels of pressure that come with that you know suddenly you've created a machine that has a lot of moving parts and a lot of people involved who you suddenly are responsible for stuff like that that is very difficult to under- understand and, and to feel you know empathy or compassion for it's impossible to be empathetic towards that because unless you're in that experience Hmm. because it's like it's privileged (laughs) right but but it's very real though that that you know it's it's not yeah i mean it'd be great to be like well i have everything and i've done it all and so life's easy now um more power to anyone who can do that but like most people are like holy holy shit i'm in a whole new unknown zone and now suddenly like there's all this pressure going on. Now there's a crew that works for the band. And if I stop doing the tours, then I can't hire the crew anymore. And then they don't have jobs anymore. And they're depending they're on... They're depending on... If families... They're, de- they're depending on me. But the problem is, is that no matter how big the tour is, like the bigger the tour gets, the more expensive the tour is. So at what point is it really that self-sustaining? You know, it's like, tr- it's tricky. Hmm. It's tricky. Um and and that but that's just one tiny tiny example i think that's pretty good the like beck not getting no one would book him is that true i thought it, it and no looking one, the outside in it seems like that was just a straight no, away path to success but yeah <laughs> everyone always thinks <laughs> yeah. that but there was a period where this guy i mean there was five years of this guy's career where he was just trying to figure it out and then got to the point where you know, no clubs would book him, and he stuck to his vision. He stuck to it. He's just like, no, I'm going to stick to this. This is, this is, I'm going to make this work. It's going to get hmm. good. He would hang out at clubs, and he became friends with these bands, and they would let him play while they were breaking their equipment down. So after five years of, you know, sleeping on people's couches and doing stuff like that, you know, all he ever heard was, you suck, you suck, you suck. Suddenly, like being in the media and the first the first thing that the media says is like this guy came out of nowhere and he's can't be the real thing this is like a one-hit wonder and like that was the initial thing and his response to that was complex you know he it was harder for he was sensitive artist so even though he was able to somehow persevere through like club bookers saying you suck you suck you suck yeah the media is just going like you suck. You suck. You're you're not the real thing. He was like, "Wow, this is harsh. This is really hard." <laughs> and then like, "How are you supposed to continue?" It's like, "Oh, I worked so hard for 5 years and I got it. This is amazing. I'm going to I'm going to pop the champagne now." And then the first thing you get is like, "You'll never, you know, you, you've score, made it this man. far, but you're not going to make it because we just want to make fun of you and doubt you." Oh my god. <laughs> so now I know you're doing 
um, you said Roger Waters, you're drumming on that right now. Yeah. Right. So how did that, you know, gig come about? That's a pretty cool gig. Just, did you just get a phone call? My buddy who we did um, Ultra Easter with and Adams for Peace, Nigel is producing uh, Roger. So he, you know, it's basically like, dude, we got to, we got to work with Roger. It's going to be cool. And it is. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll do a quick lightning round. Ready? Talk to us about, you know, having a, a, a four-year-old now, right? You know, the, the balance, you know, between getting out on the road and, you know, having a family. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, it for me, it's like, just don't tour that much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love playing a little bit, but um, just a little bit. You want to be there for all those moments, though, right? I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. I like being there. And I mean, I might be insanely busy sometimes, but I generally like my schedule's pretty like things don't usually start until noon so I can hang out in the mornings a lot and and I can be around a lot if I do go on a long tour it's going to have to be cushy enough for my family to be there which is cool but I yeah. but you know I've been playing with Beck so and he doesn't really love to go out that much so it works perfectly <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah and we have a great time world you know obviously we're dear old friends so well, that's awesome. Yeah. What do you think a common self-inflicted hurdle is that trips up a lot of aspiring artists? Just being around a lot of aspiring artists. I, I think like. I just figured it out. I mean, the ego battle, like, because your ego is going to probably, like, run you off the cliff. Your ego's not your amigo. I don't <laughs> think so. I'm, I'm feeling like it's... I mean, it's going to... That's... If without being like a total narcissist there's no way you're gonna like front a band or or be an actor yeah, there, or something there, like there's that there's a weird dichotomy there isn't it because you need it but it can like you know destroy you at the same time but within that you have to be able to somehow like you know make the right decisions um that are you know that are going to further what you want to do and um i just feel like i see when people are kind of kind of like able to um focus on what they want to what they really want to do it seems like those are the people who end up being really successful and that cuts both ways it can be people who are like well i'm more i'm more like artsy fartsy and <clears throat> i'm just going to be you know i'm going to have a little niche and they do it and they survive you know and other people who are like well you know what i might i have all the ability i have as, as much ability as the as next best like person who's doing what i'm doing talent wise right talent wise yeah. like i'm just as good of a keyboard player i'm the best keyboard player probably mm -hmm. alive as good as the best but what i really want to do is fucking pop music and mm. i'm going to put all my eggs in that basket because that's what i like mm. and then those are the ones that i know anyway that's the ex that they end up doing it the problem is it can't be about money <laughs> Don't let th don't let that make the decision for you. You're saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's the the tricky balance. It's like you have to look beyond the money mm -hmm. side of it, and and that's that's what's going to trip us all up. And <laughs> there's no way around it because you need money to, to survive. Live. Yeah, that's right. And in this day and age, like you know, if you're an artist, there's like a lot of a lot riding on you know even your reputation, riding on like how much money you're making so and what advice would you give to your 18 year old self oh yeah that's a good one um trust your instincts and believe in yourself figure out what you really want to do believe in it and don't don't follow what you think you have to do and use your head to figure out how to follow what your heart is telling you to do it's been a great interview right on dude yeah thank you man thank you that's fun. Careful. See you guys next episode. Cheers. <laughs>